In 1986, Amstrad launched what was arguably the most important computer released in Europe for the uptake of IBM PC compatible ownership. Today we're exploring that machine, the 1512 and the 1640 over here, and we're finding out just what makes them so important and so special. RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers, yes, two machines on the desk today to tell our story. The PC1512DD with its two floppy disk drives there, and the PC1640 over here, which is in absolutely mint condition. I, I think you'll struggle to find a better example, and we'll get a good look at that machine today. The 1512, on the other hand, I haven't even tested it, so we'll see if we come across any problems, and maybe we can fix a few things while we tell the story. And what a story there is to be told, and I think to start telling it, we need to set the scene and we need to go back to 1986. Here in Europe, we were no stranger to IBM PC compatibles, particularly in the workplace. In the home, we were more hooked on the wide range of 8-bit micros like ZX Spectrums, Commodore 64s, BBC Micros, especially in schools, and Amstrad's own range, the CPC range, to name but a few. They were largely incompatible with one another, but their low price point compared to IBM PC compatibles made them an attractive entry into computing for home users. It was in this year, 1986, that IBM announced the PCXT 286, a 286 based computer with 640 kilobytes of RAM and a 20 megabyte hard disk. That came in at a cool 4,000 US dollars or about 3,000 pounds here in the UK. And you have to remember at this time that IBM had a market share of 40 to 44 percent of that IBM PC market, which it had essentially created with its products. Pretenders like Compaq had a market share of about 16% for comparison, but they were making gains on IBM Stronghold. It was in this environment that Amstrad decided to follow up their CPC range like the 464 here and the disk-based 6128, both of which were based on the Z80 CPU, as well as their PCW word processing machines, which were incredibly popular like the 8256 and the 9512, also Z80 based machines. And what they followed it up with was really quite groundbreaking. An 8086 based machine for just £399 plus tax for the base model. Done right, this could take IBM PC compatibles into a price bracket previously unheard of and catapult them into the home market. Let's see just what these machines are made of then, starting with the older 1512, which we can assume from the floppy left in the drive, belongs to Doris. I wonder what secrets Doris has to hide. Perhaps we can find out a little later. Now, Alan Sugar, the man behind Amstrad, loved to undercut competitors through the use of low-cost injection moulding and repackaging of standard electronics parts into something that looked the part to the layman, while offering adequate performance to satisfy for the price, if not blow you away. Hi-fis, amplifiers and computers were among those products, and yes, this conforms to that ethos. It's made from cheap materials, but that's not to say it doesn't feel fairly well constructed. These plastics don't creak, they don't flex, and it's quite a sturdy unit on the whole, and regardless of if they were cost saving, there are some nice design choices. The monitor sits snugly on top of the case, where you'll notice a battery bay. Four AA batteries are used for the real-time clock, which have been removed from both systems. That means no leaking battery on the system board itself, and a reduced likelihood of damage as a result of leaking batteries if you're looking to collect such a system. Why can't more old PCs have been designed like this? Upgrading the machine was designed to be very easy with this removable piece which reveals three full-length 8-bit ISA expansion slots, so you can install all sorts here, including for example Amstrad's own 2400 board modem card. Simplicity was key to Amstrad's experience and that's reflected in the external port arrangement. On one side we have a mouse port which is an Amstrad specification, it's incompatible with serial mice which were more common at the time. There's also a keyboard port and my favourite feature, a volume knob for the PC speaker. Yes, you can turn the beeps up and down and that's an ability that was severely lacking on nearly all PCs. The keyboard also sports a DB9 joystick port. This maps a joystick to unused keyboard scan codes. In theory, this means we can use a huge range of joysticks, but many titles were unable to use these scan codes as they expected a game port. 
Finally, on the rear, it's very simple. DC input and video out connect to the monitor, with the 57 watt PSU for this machine being built into the monitor itself. That passes through into the PC, which perhaps simplified the experience, making for one less power plug for the user. But it did mean that uprating your PSU was no longer an option. Let's remember though, if you had PSU upgrades in mind, then this PC probably wasn't aimed at you. Finally, standard serial and parallel ports are also present. Let's open it up and see what's inside, and then we'll compare it with the later 1640 model and see what the differences are. Inside, a large space is dominated by the five and a quarter inch floppy drives and their shielding. These drives have a 360 kilobyte capacity and the system could come with one or two drives. If you opted for the hard drive model, then one of these bays would be occupied by a 10 or 20 megabyte hard drive, depending on your choice. With it all removed, our system board is revealed. It's a single board for this floppy drive only model with no expansions or daughter boards. Amstrad's goal here then was to create an affordable PC without falling foul of IBM's lawyers, and we'll see some interesting features to avoid that. So what exactly did Doris get for her hard-earned cash in 1986? Well, let's start with the heart of the machine. That's an Intel AT86 processor running at eight megahertz. And you'll see the empty slot next to it into which you can install an AT87 maths coprocessor, but that was clearly too much power for Doris to handle, so that lies vacant. Two ROM chips amounting to 16 kilobytes are known as the ROS or Resident Operating System. This is in place of the BIOS which IBM is so protective over and which is key to controlling the communications between the CPU and peripherals. At the time, Alan Sugar told PC Magazine the following. The ROS has been designed and engineered with no reference to the IBM machine. It has been audited by lawyers in the US and the UK, and the writers of the ROS have been divorced from any IBM ROS, and were just given a specification of what they had to do. We are quite happy that the independent auditors have compared our ROS with IBM, and that there is no similarity whatsoever. Rather generously, Amstrad includes 512 kilobytes of RAM on board, but also additional sockets to increase this to 640 kilobytes. Again, Doris was not power hungry and 512K was sufficient for her. In total, eight configurations of this machine were available, and those included the choice of a monochrome or color monitor, which were driven by the CGA video mode with some unusual Amstrad enhancements. CGA is a video mode introduced by IBM in 1981. It supports four colors in a 320 by 200 resolution, or two colors in a higher 640 by 200 resolution. But Amstrad decided to add their own custom Amstrad mode, which has 16 color support in 640 by 200 mode. Software, of course, has to be specifically written to support this mode, so there are very few titles, but the OS which shipped with it does include support for that custom mode, and we'll see the OS a little later on. This is a nice addition, but the improved EGA graphics mode was already on the market by this time, and VGA would appear the following year in 1987, so we're not on the cutting edge, but it is adequate for the price, and a nice little extra. It's worth noting also that Amstrad gives a composite CGA output only via this DIN socket. A good quality CGA adapter at the time would provide RGBI digital CGA video out, as well as the composite mode. But in what is no doubt a cost saving exercise, we just have the composite mode. This machine's not too dirty, but as we have it stripped down, I took the opportunity to give it a quick cleanup. How about if you were iron up this machine in 86, but your favorite computer magazine was printing rumors of a follow-up, 1987's Amstrad PC 1640. Was it worth waiting for that instead? Well, let's compare the two and find out. Our 1640 then shares exactly the same case and ports with the exception of the video output port, and we'll come on to that, but the difference that's most obvious when opening it up is that we have an expansion card present, and it's not in one of the three easily accessible expansion slots, it's located in this extra fourth slot, which is only accessible by opening up the case. What we have here is a Western digital hard drive controller. It's an 8-bit ISA card, and of course we need that because instead of two floppy drives in our 1640, we have a hard disk in the second bay. We'll take a look at that now. By the time the 1640 was released, Amstrad was really making waves with the 1512. And with this range of computers, they captured 25% of the European computer market. Not just IBM PC compatibles, but all computers across the board. 
It wasn't all plain sailing though, Amstrad developed a reputation, rightly or wrongly, for being unreliable. The foundation for this was the lack of a cooling fan inside the system, the absence of which it was speculated was simply to save money. The reality however was that it wasn't at all necessary because the PSU was housed inside the monitor and not the desktop case. These stories troubled stockists and customers alike. Still adamant that they weren't necessary, Amstrad added fans anyway more as a marketing exercise than anything else, just to calm nerves. It was then later discovered that the source of these rumours was IBM salesman. We have the original Tandon hard disk here. The P-shaped design is typical of Tandon with a pinion rack stepper motor off to one side. Tandon were the world's largest independent producer of disk drives for PCs in the mid 80s and would sell its data storage business to Western Digital in 1988, hence why we no longer really hear of them. Comparing the system boards then, our 1640 is on the left and our 1512 on the right. The 1640 still has exactly the same 8086 CPU and the same vacant space for a coprocessor. We do have that additional ISA slot with the hard drive controller in it and we also have more RAM. The 1640 is shipping with 640 kilobytes as standard but there are no additional RAM sockets this time to upgrade it. A key difference though is the video chip, instead of Amstrad's enhanced CGA chip, this time we can output to the EGA standard. An EGA was backwards compatible with Hercules and CGA modes. With EGA we would then have 16 colours from a palette of 64 and a 640x350 resolution, providing you bought the high resolution Amstrad monitor to support that mode with the system. Interestingly though, we still have an Amstrad IC labelled up as the video adapter, but also a Western Digital Paradise chip, and this is a video chip too. So I'm speculating here, but I think the Paradise chip handles the newer video modes, with the Amstrad chip for compatibility with the custom CGA Amstrad mode, because a regular EGA chip wouldn't be able to support that mode. But if you know another reason for this configuration, do leave a comment, I'd love to hear it. Our new EGA video is complemented by a standard 9-pin video output instead of the 1512's DIN video out, but all other ports are identical. Finally, the keyboard should get a mention because this has an odd looking design. Notice the function keys on the left, the position of the alt and control keys and, well, all sorts of oddities compared to a regular PC keyboard. This too was a step taken to avoid the wrath of IBM's lawyers. The steps Amstrad took to create their IBM PC compatible, they all held up and legal action was avoided. And with that, I think we have a good overview of the DNA of these machines. So those are our systems, the 1512 and the 1640, Amstrad's first two forays into IBM PC compatibles. I think the additional RAM taking up to 640K on the later model, and of course the hard drive controller and hard drive will make a big difference to this machine. But that's not to say you couldn't have upgraded the original 1512 by slotting in a controller and of course you've got the slots for additional RAM. So it's not a huge upgrade if you were an original owner, you could have taken it up to that level. Whether I can demonstrate these both, I'm not quite sure yet. I've certainly got the monitor for the 1640. The different monitor output on the 1512 might foil us, so I'm not sure if we can demonstrate that, but there's only one way to find out. Let's put them all back together. I also managed to get some spares from eBay, uh, very cheap, just some extras for the 1512. So for example, we can put the missing expansion slot cover back on there. So even if we can't demonstrate it, we can take it back to a more complete state and I can go on the lookout for a monitor that I can demonstrate it with at a later time. Right, let's put these back together and see what they can do.
This sounds great every time you switch it on. I just want to touch on a few areas here then to prove that this is indeed an IBM PC compatible system. The operating system shipped by Amstrad is Microsoft's MS-DOS version 3.2. Amstrad originally agreed to use Digital Research's DOS Plus operating system, refusing to pay Microsoft's fee for MS-DOS. At the last minute though, when Microsoft realised the potential of the Amstrad PC, it did drop its price quickly, and Amstrad got the OS it wanted and indeed needed for IBM compatible users to take the product seriously, particularly in North America. With 16 megabytes free on our disk, we have plenty of space to play with, and from it we can run such programs as WordStar, a word processor which had a dominant market share in the early 80s until WordPerfect took its crown. If we complement this with Amstrad's own DMP3000 dot matrix printer, you are now king of the village newsletter. Microsoft Windows, version 2 of which wouldn't be released until December 1987, was not included with Amstrad's. They chose instead GEM, or Graphics Environment Manager, created by Digital Research. You will immediately recognise this if you were an Atari ST user, but it was also available for IBM PCs, where it never really gained popularity. Now the monitor I have is an Amstrad MD or monochrome display, but if we had the colour display, you'd get to enjoy the full EGA palette in programs such as Paint and this example of a tiger here. MS-DOS programs can be launched within GEM where it drops back out to DOS to run it, in this case WordStar again as an example, and then on closing it we are returned back to GEM. It's simple but then so were most GUI operating systems at the time, they still had a lot of maturing to do, but it did give our Amstrad owners the opportunity to use their mouse and feel like their computer was cutting edge. A really nice addition here is Locomotive BASIC 2. Users of the Amstrad CPC range would have been familiar with this flavour of BASIC where it was built into the ROM, and the inclusion of commands to create window-based applications in GEM is a really nice touch for budding programmers. And finally, you will want to know what did Doris have on her floppy disks I'm sure. Well it was actually a bootable floppy which launched the application New Word and contained a few text documents, including this nonsense verse, in a file named Laura. One fine day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back they faced each other, drew their swords and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard the noise and came and shot these two dead boys. I really hope Doris went on to become an author. So what can we conclude then from our Amstrad IBM PC compatibles? Well, they proved very well that you don't need to have the IBM style computer with a separate card for every single part of it, a floppy controller, a serial port controller, and all of these things, they effectively got them down to one board. And that may not seem very radical now, but it certainly was at the time. While the 1512 was successful with the 1640, Amstrad were really riding high on their success, and they tried to follow it up with the PC2000, but those reliability claims came back, and they weren't just claims this time. Seagate hard drives in the PC2000s were falling over left, right, and center. The failure rate was just too high, and Amstrad's reputation for unreliable PCs was cemented. Businesses just couldn't afford to take the risk, and they didn't. Amstrad would go on to claim £53 million pounds plus interest from Seagate in damages. Amstrad wouldn't go on to repeat the success of the 1512 or the 1614 sales, although they did go on to sell PCs, especially to the home market for many years to come. You will have seen things like the Amstrad Mega PC, in which they integrate a Mega Drive and a PC. Lots of quirky designs, lots of attractive things to the home user, but they never managed to crack the business market. And who knows, maybe if they did... Maybe they could have been as successful as the likes of Dell. Their legacy then was that at the time, 86, 87, they proved that there was a thirst, there was a hunger for low-cost IBM PC compatibles. People wanted them, people just couldn't afford them. Amstrad proved that it was possible to make an affordable IBM PC compatible. They proved that people wanted to buy them and competitors responded accordingly. In the following years, we would see the price of IBM PC compatibles driven down and the likes of you, me and Doris could get them in our homes. And I think in the long run, every one of us benefited from what Amstrad did. As always, thank you for watching. Take care and see you soon.
if you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support. Thank you.